What's up guys, welcome along to today's video. Today we're going to be looking at doing a modification to the chain and sprockets on the GSX-R. I ain't fitting no chain fool, a bit of the fool, I do, I do. So here we are, we got the bike up on a paddock stand. What we're going to do is remove the old chain first, that is the first job. Now before we do this, we've actually got to get to this front sprocket and the front sprocket cover has to come off, which means this fairing also has to come off. Not too much of an issue as we're going to be servicing the bike anyway. But let's whip these fairings and this cover off, simple matter of a few Allen key bolts, and then come back to it and actually start removing this old chain and sprockets. So that's the fair enough guys, nice and straightforward, a few formal allen key bolts, got that out of the way. Next up to get the cover off, we've got to take shift linkage off. Now this is actually nice and easy to put back on, it's in a horizontal plane, but you can adjust this angle on the splines depending on where you want your shift lever or even all the way around the bottom. On this particular one you can have a raised shift, but if you're not sure, just pop a little mark on it before you take it apart. So you know you're going to put it back in the same place, and then we should just be able to whip this pinch bolt out. Most of them have to come all the way out because they don't just pinch. You see on the on the actual selector shaft, there's a little semicircle groove that it has to go through. So they do need to come all the way out, like so. It doesn't look particularly pretty, so we'll be replacing that. And now your shift lever should just pop off just like that. Now we've got access to the cover bolts, a few five mil bolts. And we should just be able to whip this front sprocket cover off. So I've just whipped the expansion bottle out of the way so we can see a bit clearer what we're trying to do. Cracked all the bolts off now, hopefully this front cover should just slip off like so and reveal however many years of dirt and grime and muck in there that's not been cleaned off. So always a good opportunity when you're doing these kind of jobs to be able to get in there and give it all a really nice clean. So like I say, these can be pretty tight, so hopefully taking it off a nice nut gun should undo it. Just like that, nice and easy. But when we're putting it back together, we don't want to be using a nut gun to gun it up, as it can pull the output shaft against the bearings and actually cause premature wear. So that's why we leave the chain on in case we need to either use the rear brake or block the rear wheel with a piece of wood against a swing arm to be able to get a big bar and crack it off. Now we've got this nut off, we can actually get on and remove the old chain. So there are many ways to remove a chain from a bike, however the quickest and easiest is just to get an angle grinder and to grind these rivet heads down and then knock the pin off. So for that, we need an angle grinder with a flap disc on it is the easiest, quickest way. We need a large, bad mother chisel, a hammer, and obviously the two other most important things are PPE and make sure you've got your apprentice to catch the sparks to resell them. So once you've ground this down until it's all smooth and you can't see where the rivet holes are, keeping it on the sprocket, not down here somewhere, on the sprocket, Get your chisel in behind that plate and give it a nice, strong, confident whack. And it won't come off. Eventually, it will fire off. Now, we can hopefully push the rear one out. Yep, not too solid and we should be able to remove the old chain. There she is, no injuries. So now we've got the chain off, we can just remove the back wheel by undoing this large nut there, previously loosened. Pushing out our axle.
removing it from the other side and remove the rear wheel. Now let's go over to the workbench and talk about chains and sprockets. Right, so here we are over at the workbench with a few old chains and sprockets laid out. We're just going to run through a little bit of the theory behind chains and sprockets. So what we've got here are the 5 series chains. So we've got a 530, a 525 and a 520. These are the, the sizes you're going to see on big uh, road bikes, super bikes, anything that's got a bit of power behind it. And they're all going to have riveted links rather than a, a clip that holds them together. So the difference between the 5 series, 530, 25 and 20 is basically the thickness of the plate and the strength of the chain. So if we just grab a vernier gauge, and you can actually see here, the 530 is 22.36 across the links. 525 is 21.08. And a 520 is 17.55. That is also reflected in the thickness of the sprocket. So obviously the 530 has a thicker sprocket than a 525. And if we just grab this 520 out of here, easier said than done, you can see the 520 is the thinnest of the three. It has no and it has no difference at all on the actual pitch of the teeth, whether it's a 30, 25 or 20. You can see there, hopefully, the pitch of the teeth is the same between the three sizes. It's just the thickness of the chains and the sprockets. So, why do we have different sizes? Obviously, the biggest, thickest chain is going to be for the most powerful bikes, and the thinnest, smallest chain is going to be for the least powerful bikes. Heavier, more robust chain is going to have more reciprocating mass, more unsprung weight. Lighter chain, less reciprocating mass, less unsprung weight. But in this case, we're actually going to fit the light chain onto quite a powerful motorcycle, the same as I would do on a, a track bike or a race bike. So we're going to put the 520 on. But what we've done is using this chart here, we've actually gone for a DID 520 ZVMX. So although it is only a 520 chain, as you can see on the chart, the tensile strength of the chain here is very similar to a cheaper, more standard 530. So it will be a nice strong chain for the bike. The only problem with fitting a 520 chain to a powerful motorcycle is that they can stretch. So it's a good idea using a chain tool like this Subaki one here to keep an idea, or keep an eye on the chain stretch as you use it. Now the guy who owns this bike is also going to be doing a few track days, so that's one of the reasons he's gone for the 520. Not only does it uh, give him more options with the rear sprocket sizes, they're easy to get hold of in a 520 size. The chain has got less unsprung mass as we've explained, and it also just looks cool as penguin piss once it's on there. Now we'll have a little quick chat about O-rings. So the differences are O-rings and X-rings. So an O-ring is just a standard rubber O-ring with one contact surface, as you can see here, whereas an X-ring, if you look through the cross section of it, will have two contact surfaces either side. So the idea is it performs better at holding the grease into the pin. So this is the link to, to fit the chain. This is a riveted link, like we said, comes in a pack with the grease and some X-rings, and we'll explain the difference of the different types of rivet links when we fit it on the bike. This all got part of the kit. So we've got the rear sprocket, obviously the chain, new chain, with the rivet link and some grease. We've got a front sprocket. Obviously, because we're doing the 520 conversion, we need to change the front sprocket and the rear sprocket, as a 525 sprocket won't run on this 520 chain, which is what it was originally. And we've also got a nice new lock nut for the front sprocket to make sure it's nice and tight on there. What we're also doing is we're also changing the gearing slightly. So we are going down one tooth on the front sprocket, and up one two from the rear sprocket from a 42 to a 43. The reason we're doing this is the bikes normally come fairly long geared standard, so you'll be doing able to do 150, 160 miles an hour, which is great if you want to get home before the ice cream melts, but not so good for keeping your license. Also, that's not great on track. You want the acceleration out of the corners normally rather than the top end. So to increase the acceleration, we'll go up on the back sprocket. Obviously, if you went down, it does the opposite and gives you a better top end. 
and on the front we decrease the size of acceleration or increase it for top end. Now we need to be a little bit careful when we're choosing this because if we go too small on the front sprocket the chain will be too tight around it which we don't want and we also need to bear in mind the chain length when we're changing the gearing. So if we're going quite aggressive with the gearing and changing it quite a lot, we might need to get a longer chain to be able to still fit it on the bike. You also, as a side note, want to think about potentially the wheelbase length and the anti-squat effect when you're changing the gearing and the length of the chain, but that is getting a little bit deeper. You just want to make sure you've got a chain that will fit the length of the new sprockets. So if you want to change the gearing, but you're not quite sure what to, which way to go with it, Hopefully this will help you. To work out the ratio, we need to use this equation, driven over driver. So that is the driven sprocket, which in this case is the rear one, divided by the driver sprocket, which is the front one on the motorcycle in this orientation. So in this example, we would have 43 divided by 15, which equals 2.86 to one, which means that for every one revolution of the back wheel, the front sprocket will turn 2.86 times. Now, if we increase the rear sprocket and keep the front one the same, 45 by 15, we would get three to one. So for every one rotation of this, we're gonna get three rotations of the crankshaft. So that will be increase in acceleration. Now, if we go the other way, keep our original 43 rear sprocket and take a tooth off the front, 43 divided by 14 is 3.07 to one. So you can see that adding and removing teeth from the front sprocket has a greater effect than the rear one. It's roughly two teeth on the rear is approximately the same as one tooth on the front. You can see that here. So you can have a play around with this before you order your parts. Hopefully this will help you to choose what gearing is gonna suit you best. So the first job is to get the old sprocket off, releasing the sprocket nuts, change the rear sprocket. So whilst carrying out this task, it's also a really good idea to take things apart, give them a really good clean and inspect. It gives you the opportunity to check all your wheel bearings, all the studs on the, the drive itself, make sure they're in good condition. Remove the drive, check all your cush drive rubbers. Again, wheel bearings on the inside and just have a general look over everything. Make sure you're happy with it. Give it a really good clean because there's not a good opportunity to get in there once the wheel's back in the bike and we're ready to put the sprocket on. So this sprocket actually has got a sticker on it, a rental sticker to show you which way round it goes, but it will also have the size of the sprocket, the teeth number stamped on the front. So that always goes to the outside so that you can see the size of the sprocket fitted quite easily. Now, when it comes to fitting the lock nuts back on, inspect them, clean them, inspect them. If they're the nylock type with the blue nylock, nylon in the end, reuse, uh, don't reuse them, sorry, get new nuts because they should be one use only. These are a different kind of lock nut, so I'm happy for these to go back on. Now, unlike when we remove them, we're not just going to be gunning these down. We've got a torque setting for it, so we're going to use it. Now, over tightening the bolt is just as dangerous as under tightening it, and a lot of the time the torque setting is a much lower figure than what you think it would be. So we're going to use the gun just to nip these down in a nice diagonal pattern. It helps to pull the sprocket down square. Now we can get the torque wrench on it set to 60 newton meters, which is the setting. And again, in a nice diagonal pattern, you can actually torque the sprocket down correctly. And that is how it should be fitted. All nice and clean, torqued up. We know the lock nuts are good. Let's get it back in the bike. So here we are back over at the bike. Now, before we stick the back wheel back in, just a quick side note. Whilst you're in it, it's really nice to give everything a thorough clean and inspect it all. One thing I like to do is just whiz the, the uh, chain adjusters all the way out, give the bolts a really good clean, a bit of copper slip on there, and then they're ready for any adjustment in the future, never gonna seize in the swing arm. And also, key point here is always inspect your bikes if it's a new bike. So if you're not confident, it's always good to get somebody to look over it. So as an example, this bike was only coming in for chains and sprockets. As we've had the back wheel out, here you can see the brake pads are wafer thin. So these are the kind of things you find when you're looking over the bike closely. So we put some new rear pads in there, but especially wheels, it's nice to have the wheels out of a new bike 
put them back in, make sure everything's torqued up and adjusted right. These are powerful and can be dangerous machines, so you want to know mechanically it's completely safe. So, just a quick side note, always worth taking the wheels out and in on a new bike. So again with the front, everything's been given a really nice clean up. The inside of the covers all been cleaned and degreased. We've inspected everything, cleaned the chain guide. Now it's time to fit the new front sprocket. Again, the same as the rear one, important to get the orientation of the sprocket correct. Again, they're normally stamped on the side that faces outwards, but make sure you get it right as there might be a slight offset there to align the sprocket and the chain properly. Now, just going to leave that finger tight for the time being, same as the rear hub, get the chain on. Once we've got the chain fitted correctly, then we can sort out talking these up properly. So one of the things I like to do with a new chain, they always come covered in uh, some sort of lubricant or grease, something to stop them corroding the packaging. That's not actually helping you at all on the outside of the chain. So I always spray a bit of rag with a bit of WD-40, Wipe the chain off before we start, and that just stops you spreading all that mess everywhere. We'll explain about the lubrication once we've got it on the bike. So we just feed it around the back sprocket all the way around until we get our split link back on the rear sprocket. Now you can see we've got the chain on and we've got our split link situated nicely for us to work on it on the rear sprocket. So here is our new rivet link. Inside this packet, we've got our pack of O-rings or X-rings, grease, our link and our plate itself. Now, this is where the lubrication of a chain is important to understand. So what you're actually lubricating, where you wanna get the lubrication is between these pins and the inside of these rollers here because that actually rotates slightly in there, which is where the lubrication needs to be. So what the O-ring's job is, one either side, is to actually seal that grease in there. So when you lubricate the chain itself, you're not lubricating the pivoting points. All you're actually lubricating is the contact surface between the sprocket and the inside of that roller on the chain. So this chain actually kept falling off when I was taking the link out to show you. So I've just stuck a couple of cable ties on there just to hold it onto the sprocket, not something you normally do, but it just helps me to video and show you. So we've got a new link. We've got two new O-rings, X-rings there. We need the little pack of grease and we need to lubricate these really well and lubricate the rollers really, really well. Because like I say, you're not gonna get the opportunity to get any grease back in there at a later date. Now, once we've got the rings and the lubrication on there, we can slip it through the chain. And then we've got two more rings to fit on the other side. Same thing, lots of lubrication before we put them on. And last but not least, we've got the outer link of the chain. Again, it's actually stamped with the size and the marking of the chain on there to make sure it goes on the right way. And you can just gently rest that in position. Now we're gonna to need to use a special tool to actually fit this together. So here we have a chain riveting tool, not a particularly expensive or fancy one. There's lots of different brands out there. I've used this on quite a few chains and never had any problems with it. What we need to do is using these selection of tools, there's some pins to push bits out, some different anvils for different sizes. What we need to do is use this to push that plate on and squeeze it over the rivet link. It's quite tricky to show you guys all of this in there, but once it's together, it should look something like that. So that what we're gonna do is turn this and it's gonna push the plate onto the rivet link itself. So hopefully you guys can see that. It's quite tricky to get the camera right in there, but we've got it against the rear link there. We've got the plate nicely squeezed up against the new plate and we need to turn this and squeeze it together until it's just in the right spot. We don't wanna to go too far because what we can actually do is seize that link up and we've ruined the new chain. What I like to do is get it on, get it started once it looks fairly close, is keep whipping this off and on. Using a vernier gauge, we can measure it against the link next to it to make sure we get the right distance. Okay. 
if it becomes a bit stiff, what's probably happened is the link is not aligned with the two holes in the tool there. Don't force it, back it off, double check the alignment of the holes, and then go again. So you can see now the, the link is actually riveted on and it still has movement in it. It's not actually seized up. So like I say, I just like to back this off now, just a little bit, pull it out of the way. Now we can check how far on we've pressed that compared to the next link along. Again, just utilizing a digital vernier gauge. So we can see the one above it is reading 17.5. And this one is reading 17.56. So I'm more than happy enough with that. We've not frozen the link. We've got plenty of free play in it. It's nicely pushed on together. We've got the grease and the O-rings in there. Last little bit now is to finish off peeling over the rivets on the end. Okay, so I've cut the cable ties off and I've moved it round and double checked that there's definitely no frozen link in the one that we have just crimped together, which is perfect. Back onto the sprocket. Now there's different pins and different ways of riveting these different tools. Some of them are pinned over on the outside, but the ones like this with the hole in the center, you're actually driving like an anvil through the middle to just slightly pin them outwards and stop that plate coming back off. Now there are ones who utilize a hammer to fix these. I'm not a huge fan of them, especially on these lighter Renfro analyzed sprockets. I do like to use the ones where it presses it in. You don't want to go too far with these because what you'll do is make that so thin it cracks and then the plate comes off. Again, there is actually some official measurements for this, which utilizing the vernier gauge, you can go on and actually measure and see when you're happy with how far they've gone over. So we utilize the same tool to fit to pin the end of the rivets over. We've just changed a few of the adapters. We've now got a little dimple bit on there which fits in the center of the pin and a single anvil, and we'll probably have to use a spanner on these rather than the bar, as they do take a little bit of force to peen over. So now we just do them one at a time, and pop him on the back, wind him up until he touches, nice and central like so. Now we can wind this in and just flare the end of that over slightly. So now we can see that first one's flared. This one's still not flared. So we can see the original size was 0 0.20. Now this one is reading 0 0.22, which again, referring to the flare size chart on this DID chart, we can see that's a perfectly good flare. Any further and it will make it too thin. So we just need to do the same on the last one and then we can button it up. There we have it, they're both flared. They both still got a nice bit of play in the link, no frozen link. Be careful and patient when you're rooting these. You don't wanna to go too far. It's better to keep taking it off and checking it than what it is go too far, and then you need to get yourself another new link. So now we've got the chain on, we can adjust the chain tension, torque up the front sprocket, get it all back together. So once you've done your final adjustment, it's always a good idea to whack the wheel in Give it a good spin so you can check the tension on your chain. Also, on these axle blocks, these aren't particularly accurate to get the wheel straight. So I just like to use a steel rule, square up against the axle block, and then you can read the number off of there. Mimic it on the other side to make sure you've got your wheel dead straight and parallel. Once you're happy with the adjustment, happy with the tension, we can torque the axle nut up to specify torque. Give the wheel one more spin. Double check your tension to make sure you're happy. Last but not least, don't forget to pump up that rear caliper. So now we've got the back end back together. Again, as well as pumping up the rear caliper, don't forget to lock off your adjusting nuts. 
we can torque up this front sprocket nut because we can use the chain to hold the, uh, the sprocket still. So what I like to do is use a block of wood through between the wheel and the swing arm. Now be careful you don't do this in a position on the wheel where the valve is and then you can lock the wheel against that. Using a torque wrench, this one's 120 newton meters. We can actually torque that nut up. Now for the eagle-eyed amongst you, you will see I've actually utilized the old front sprocket nut here. And that is because this new one that comes with the kit is actually not a lock nut and it looks far more lighter duty. So I'm happy to put the old lock nut back on. Final bit, chuck the covers back on and loop the chain up. So two top tips for lubricating the chain. One, do it when the chain's warm and you've come back from a ride, get it on a stand quickly, wipe it off with a bit of WD-40 in a rag to clean it, and then lubricate your chain and spray it in, on the inside of the chain here as it goes round, not on the outside of the chain there. All it will do there is fling off and make a mess. So do it when it's warm and spray it on the inside and you should be able to keep your chain in much better condition much easier. You're never gonna be able to lubricate properly inside these pins, but if we fit it correctly, we shouldn't need to. So there it is, bike is all back together. Everything's tight, talked up, all done. We've still got the fairings off as we're actually servicing this, checking valve clearances and other bits as well. So we've left that off for the time being, but hopefully that's gonna give a bit of improved acceleration, improved performance, saved a bit of weight, made it easier to change the rear sprockets and basically just looks a lot cooler in general. So I hope you've enjoyed that guys, coming along doing that. I hope you've learned something, maybe picked a little tip or trick up somewhere. If you've enjoyed it, please subscribe, check out some of the other how-to videos on the channel, pop some links in the description at the end of this video. Yeah, thanks for watching. Look after yourselves. Ta-ta.